Thank you for joining us for this episode. Today, we're joined by Dr. Michael Lipson, and we're going to be speaking about a survey that he did on what the current status is of orthokeratology fitters in the United States. Optometric Insights Media proudly presents the Myopia Podcast, where we give you the latest myopia research, clinical topics, and industry insights. Make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of our awesome myopia content. And now to our host, a massive myopia manager himself, Dr. David Kading. Well, thank you for joining us for this episode of the Myopia Podcast. I'm excited to have uh, my longtime friend, Mike Lipson, joining us today. Mike, how are you today? Doing great. It's summertime in Michigan and the sun is out and uh, things are good. Yeah. So, so for people who don't know, where, where, where do you live in Michigan? Where, where's that at? I'm uh, northwest of Detroit in the suburbs mm -hmm. out in the country near the lakes area. It's Commerce, Michigan, actually. Yeah. Um, lower Michigan. It's a great time to be in Michigan this time of year. So yeah, absolutely. As, as you uh, probably know, I uh, retired from my uh, work at University of Michigan. Where I was doing you were there uh, a long time. Long time. I was there about 20 years at the university, and it was a clinical practice. I did uh, teach about for one hour a year, <laughs> <laughs> but I did uh, mostly clinical practice and specialty care contact lenses. Yeah. yeah, well, obviously we've all benefited from your clinical expertise and teaching us how to do things and so forth. What is Michael Lipson up to these days? How are you spending your glory years after retirement? Well, I was uh, pretty happily in retirement and I thought maybe I would do some consulting, but uh, I really wasn't actively pursuing it, but it pursued me. <laughs> so, <laughs> and it was uh, kind of fun. I, I have a couple pet projects. One that I started just uh, before retirement uh, is about vision related quality of life and right. questionnaires and validated questionnaires to assess that quality of life. And, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, relative to myopia management, there was a paper that we actually finally got published last um, fall. And just recently, uh, over the last year, the biggest project that we've encountered now and taken on is a survey to assess the ortho -K market. Mm -hmm. um, I know a lot of manufacturers have tried to do surveys and a lot of magazines do surveys, but nothing of this nature has ever been done before. Yeah, yeah. This this is a fantastic paper. You published it in the Academy. I'm just giving bringing everybody up to speed. It was optometry recently. and vision science. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Optometry and vision science, um, and uh, and was just recently published as of when we're speaking in in mid 2022. Um, but a, a, a major overhaul here, I, I think one of the astounding things is 3,000 people uh, are fitting ortho K was one of the statistics that you found in here. Exactly. Yeah. Um, it was, it's interesting because up until now, we've kind of been guessing at that number right. and uh, throwing darts and saying, is it about this much or is it about that? And we can guess a little bit you know, from our own experiences on how many people attend the meetings, how many people we know of, but it was a really big effort to try to coordinate with the manufacturers, mm -hmm. with the survey respondents, and combining all of this data together is what we come up with on that. But even though the number may be a little surprising, I mean, some people may have guessed it closer to 500 people fitting worth okay, some people would have guessed 10,000. But this is not a number that was generated just from the number of people who are certified. Mm -hmm. uh, we went to the manufacturers and some of the major ones were able to give us data on those who are active within the last 12 months. Yeah, which is a considerably different percentage. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> many, many people are certified to fit and don't. Huh. Uh, did you so, did, did you dig into it all whether they they have done it over the last couple of years or did your survey just really dig into in the last year or how what's considered active? 
active in the last year. Yeah. And it, it's also interesting, too, that you uh, kind of bring that up, is that um, the number of people uh, who responded to the survey, about 52% of those who responded to the survey were active fitters. And there were a number of people who were responding to the survey about ortho K, 48% who were non-fitters and were able to share their opinions regarding ortho K, why they may not do it, things like that. But yeah, for, like if I see a survey and I'm not doing something, I probably don't respond to the survey. So that's right. That, it was pretty darn good representation of the um, the profession overall, too. I, I was pretty proud of that part. But yeah. of the respondents who were fitting ortho K, about a quarter of them have been fitting ortho K for more than 15 years. Uh huh. And about a third of them were less than two years. Really interesting. <laughs> so there's a lot of people that are uh, just new to the fitting of ortho K and a lot of people who are getting into it. I and think that kind of speaks to how myopia management seems to be, be catching on. Really getting some momentum. Yes. You know, maybe we're doing a good job of uh, making myopia matter, which is a, a big thing to me and helping people realize that ortho K doesn't have to be rocket science completely. That's yeah. right. And there are obviously, if you know, the readers or the, the listeners today know a lot about ortho K. Um, they know there's a lot of different manufacturers, a lot of different methods to fit it. And uh, you can dive very deep into customizing ortho K, mm -hmm. or you can uh, kind of oversee the process that somebody else is uh, yep. Giving you a lot of details, fit, right? Yep. Yeah. Empirically fit and monitored with great consulting. Yeah. Teams. So, so Mike, I mean, you 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 describe this in the paper, but can you can you whittle down to us again how you how you came up with three thousand people? It's um kind of a, a complex issue, but essentially, um, I get I can go into the paper to see this, but uh. It's a combination of factors of, say, taking the major manufacturers who maybe supply 95% of the ortho mm -hmm. K lenses out there. Which is like four, four of them. Right? Yes, exactly. Okay. And they were very cooperative with us. And we, we told them what we were doing and tried to explain this and said, can you give us, you know, how many people are certified? And we got that number. And they now we said, okay, now can you tell us who's ordering, who's active accounts over the last year? Mm -hmm. And that was one way. But then we had to kind of reverse engineer the estimate by taking the number of people who responded to the survey and how many lenses they were prescribing and how that compared to those active fitters and try to extrapolate the data to that. And it came out pretty close. Mm -hmm. um, I guess, you know, to describe it, uh, the number of active fitters, I went through this. Um, to verify the number, the second calculation is the total number of active certifications was weighted based on the number of designs prescribed by each individual doctor. Mm -hmm. In other words, in the survey, some of the doctors said, well, I only fit one brand. Some of them said they fit five or six right. different brands. So we had to kind of weight those things to, to get that. And again, the final mm -hmm. number is around 3,000. Yeah. And that, as you probably know, I mean, there's about almost 40,000 ODs in this country. So that's still, you know, about seven and a half percent of the total number of ODs that are fitting, even though that sounds like a big number. Yeah. 3,000. Now, there's uh, several groups of people that are qualified to fit orthokeratology that are legally allowed to do that in the United States. Is there an overwhelming majority of contact lens fitters, ophthalmology, optometry? And what kind of setting did it seem to kind of stand out more? It was uh, a majority. Um, almost 40% were in solo practice and about 40% were in a group type practice. Mm -hmm. And those respondents 
total respondents uh, was about 87% were optometrists in our survey. Mm -hmm. uh, 7% were ophthalmologists and a small percentage were opticians. Yeah. So um, you, you, you said, and I, I don't know that you necessarily spoke about this a whole lot in the paper, but of the people who used to do ortho K, but have not been doing it somewhat recently, what did you kind of glean from them? Did, did, did you, did you learn anything or did the survey kind of point to anything or kind of questions? It, did you ask it, them? It was really uh, fascinating to me. Some of them uh, who had started and stopped, uh -huh. th there were various reasons given for that. Yeah. Um, is that kind of what you're asking? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, first thing is that, uh, some of the doctors really felt like it was too much time, and some of them felt like they weren't making enough money on it. I, I don't know how that could happen, but <laughs> they, they weren't managing this, and they didn't really dive in to doing it in, in a big way. And uh, people who really love ortho -K and do it because they love it, and they love the reaction that patients get from it, really get involved in it and it grows and, and it does well. Um, let me see if I can find that part of the paper. I can give you the specifics on it. But it was uh, really fascinating to me to see that um, the average number of years that a patient wears ortho -K was almost eight years, just under eight years. Mm. My personal experience is that patients do wear them longer than that. But um, I don't know. The, the practitioners have various reasons for not doing this or not even starting. I mean, you were asking a little bit about the people who have done it and then discontinued, correct? Yeah. Oh, okay, here we go. Or, or even reasons why people don't do it and maybe never started. I don't know if, if you dug into both of those. Um. Here's a the one question, of, you know, for those who were not uh, prescribing ortho, okay, why did you not do it in the first place? Why are you not fitting these lenses? And um, it was perceived high cost to the patient. Uh -huh. One real surprising answer that was given by almost a third of the doctors is they felt like patients weren't interested in ortho, okay. And mm. I know you're into ortho, okay yourself, and I... Yeah, did it for many years, yeah. and people are very interested in it from my standpoint. So, well, you know, Mike, a hundred percent of the people that I didn't bring it up to weren't interested. <laughs> <laughs> the docs who don't talk about it don't get them right. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. I'm, and then again, I guess maybe the way some doctors practice, um in their mode of practice, they felt like another reason given that they don't practice or it's okay is they thought it took up too much chair time. Yeah. yeah. And, and yes, people are, you know, come back for follow-ups. And it's, so it's maybe a little bit different um, you know, structure in terms of patient flow in the office. Yeah. Well, it is, you know, and I think, you know, 87% of the people were optometrists. And so I can speak being an optometrist. And, you know, I think that there's a lot of practices in the country that have got to the point where with managed vision insurance plans, they're, uh, they're trying to continue to make the same amount of money that they've always made. And the insurance companies aren't paying us anymore. Right. And so that's required us to have to go from one patient an hour to two to three. And some practices are four or five patients an hour. And now you throw an ortho K into that loop. And it's kind of difficult to, to just throw that in. Well, well as, as you may know, and you've experienced yourself, you know, a lot of the ortho K is outside the insurance parameters. So, absolutely. Uh, so absolutely. that's, that's why I felt that it was a, it was a no brainer to, to keep doing it like that. And yeah. we, we were, it was a very big profit center for us in the office as well yeah. as a uh, no, referral I, I, source. I, I'll agree with you. I, you know, I hear practitioners say that they're just too busy to do something like that. And I say, well, 
you know, if you, if, if you take more time to do something like worth, okay. And you charge more money for it because it brings the value to the patients. I mean, there's a reasons why people are wearing it for eight years yep. just because they like it. Right. Yep. Now, not everybody. It's not hundred percent of my patients do it every single year, but many of them keep doing it and keep paying that high price because they see the value in it. And I think sure. that's just part of it. Well, my patients aren't interested in that. Well, I think it's that you're not interested, you know, exactly see, see right where it fits in. And I think it can be one of those things where we go back to the days of taking more individualized, you know, focused care, um, where, as if you're seeing six patients an hour, it's really hard to slow down and say, okay, how am I going to, you know, really address this with this patient. Very interesting data, you know, especially the reasons why, why they're not doing it. We don't, we don't survey too many people of why they're not doing orthokeratology One more. and myopia management. Mm -hmm. Digging that question just a little bit deeper, you know, that question was asked, why don't you prescribe ortho -K? Okay. And again, just to review, high cost to patients, patients aren't interested, too much chair time were the most commonly mentioned things. Well, the next question was kind of more of an open-ended question on the opinion on why more doctors are not prescribing ortho -K. Mm -hmm. okay? And it didn't have to do specifically with, you know, whether they are prescribing or not, but even the doctors, everybody was asked this question, whether they prescribe ortho -K or not, why are not more doctors throughout the country doing this? Right. And um, th there were about three common things. One, time. Number two, learning curve. Cost factors. Some doctors mentioned safety concerns. But one fascinating thing, I guess, to me as an old timer with this, is unfamiliarity with gas perm materials. <laughs> How about that? Mm. And some people, because it's a gas perm lens, are just not going to jump on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, again, I, I think you and I are preaching to the choir here with uh, the, the listeners that we have. But um, for those of you who may see these as the reasons why you think you're not doing it, um, you know, I think we look to the, the SMART study, right? The SMART study showed that eight of the 10 offices that were in that, that study had never fit that brand of ortho K lenses before, right? And in the, the parameters of that study, all they had to do is K's, RX, HVID, and they ordered the lenses. They put the lenses on, the patients left, came back, their follow-up, and over 85% of them were successful with that first set of lenses. There, exactly. there wasn't much of a learning curve. There wasn't really much of uh, a lot of extra chair time, you know, and uh, they, the, the cost, the patients, you know, as we see patients would pay for it. And um, it seems like a, a good way to go. Now, the safety concern, we've looked at that, right? You've, you've been part of studies and, and, and we've read plenty of them showing the safety mm -hmm. and effectiveness is worth okay. I think uh, relative to safety, there are volumes of articles about the safety factors and the um, really the, the unanimous conclusion out of all of these things is yes, there is a risk. Yeah. The risk is minimal and the minimal risk can be further minimized if you really, you know, follow up with your patients and ensure compliance. Wash so, your hands. Right? <laughs> wash your hands, clean the lenses the right way and come in for your follow-up visits. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There you go. That'll significantly reduce it. Yeah. Um, so you, you also dug a little bit into the characteristics um, of the patients, right? Exactly. Um, can you, I know you're, I'm, I'm digging deep into your uh, article okay. here, but can you, can you speak a little bit about refractive air? Was astigmatism in there? Everything follow yes, up and was in there. Place, all that stuff. Tell, tell me what you've learned and what you find interesting. Um, well, I think interesting, and we kind of figure this out. It's kind of that goes along logically is that a, a high number of people will fit, say, 
somebody who's a four diopter myope, okay? But higher than that, the numbers start going down a little bit. So doctors will fit patients up to some of them, no limit on how nearsighted they are. About 10% mm -hmm. of the respondents said that they would have no limit to how they would go. And um, for, for people who are balking at that, let me, let me just say that probably included in that would be a minus five or a six who you correct the vast majority with orthokeratology. And then you may use a soft lens or spectacle lenses Mm -hmm. which is Pauline Cho has shown to be a, as effective or nearly as effective as doing ortho K in the full correction. As so, effective in myopia control. Yeah, yes. Right. For, for myopia control. If we're trying to correct spectacle, corrected vision to get somebody to 2020, mm -hmm. that's not why I do ortho K for most people. That's why we do it in myopia mm -hmm. management. But um, so yes, I'm sorry. I interrupted you on that. That's okay. But uh, overall, I mean, if you combine those categories together and say six or above, um, you know, or six, or, I'm sorry, six or below about 60% of the, the, the doctors would be fitting anybody up to six diopters relative to astigmatism. Um, about a quarter of the doctors said 150 was the maximum astigmatism they would attempt. And they're probably doing on label and they're comfortable only yes, on label. But yeah. that was a quarter. You know, again, statistics mm -hmm. are very, very weird to read them, but, you know, 58% would fit a two diopter astigmat. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, with the sophisticated toric designs, uh, I think a lot of people are more comfortable with those higher amounts of astigmatism. Yeah. Yeah. And for people who are new to ortho K, we really care less about the refractive astigmatism amount as mm -hmm. we do the elevation exactly. of the cornea, right? Because that tells us how we go about fitting it as opposed to really correcting the refractive well, correction. You know, you, you kind of lead into uh, the next <laughs> question in the survey <laughs> <Sorry>. here <laughs> about toric designs. Um, a lot of them, you know, a high majority, over 90% said that they do prescribe some toric designs. And uh, what I found interesting is that why people do this. And yeah. uh, in other words, some are, are proactive about it. it. means, okay, they'll look at the patient ahead of time and say, okay, if they have an elevation difference on the uh, topography map, the elevation map, that's what is going to guide them, whether they're going to start off prescribing that toric design. Others will just look at the amount of the astigmatism. But there is still a small percentage that are what I call reactive fitters relative to toric designs, meaning they're going to fit the patient with a spherical design to start with no matter what. Mm. And then they're going to say, well, if that lens doesn't center well, or the patient isn't responding as I would expect, then I, then I'll go to that lens. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, we, we, we've been looking at this and well over 50% of our, our patients are now mm -hmm. in a toric design. And um, Mike and I were talking before the podcast, we're, we're doing a study together and he's analyzing all my data. So he may be coming to me and tell me what, what I'm really at, but, <laughs> we, but well over 50%. And we've, we just, base it on the elevation of the, the topography, right? It just tells us which direction to go. And we know we're going to be far more successful with a toric design. If there's a huge elevation difference, usually over 30 microns, 40, 50 microns for sure. Um, but it's just made us way more successful. Uh, and, well, and that's, we think we're more successful. You're analyzing my yep. data. But and you're, uh, you are more successful because of the experiences that you've had. And yep. you know from that experience that when you see these elevation differences of even as low as 25 microns, yep. it's going to affect lens positioning on the eye. Yeah. So yeah. rather than wait for problems to occur, you can order yep. the best lens right off the bat. Now, what about adults versus children? Do, do people use the same design? That's, or? That was fascinating to me, especially with all the awareness of myopia management these days and some of the customizations that are being promoted 
to be better at controlling myopia that, um, you know, 57% in the survey prescribed the same lens for both adults and for children. And uh, again, maybe this goes back to the same thing we just talked about relative to toric designs is that you can be proactive on this or reactive, <laughs> meaning if you're doing ortho -K for myopia management, you know ahead of time that there are some things that you can do to prescribe a lens that will be more efficacious mm -hmm. <laughs> at slowing that progression. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, for years, I don't know that we necessarily thought there was a difference. Maybe those of you who were really smart, but it hasn't been except for the last five, six, seven years that I think people really started thinking about maybe we should do different designs for different people. And I think the Volt study taught us that a smaller optic zone may be a little bit better. And, uh, you know, there's been, there's, there's, there's been work on that for a treatment zone. Maybe we can adjust the treatment zone, get a little bit better effect. And uh, what do you suppose there? Well, I think, you know, we could talk about that particular subject for another couple podcast. hours here. <laughs> yeah. But um, optic zone size, pupil size, other factors, including, you know, lens asphericity, there's all kinds of factors. And we really, even though the indicators are very strong to show that smaller optic zone sizes seem to do better at slowing uh, myopic progression and axial elongation, um, it's not absolutely proven. And there are yeah. many patients who with standard optic zone sizes still have very good uh, myopia control. And again, there may be many other factors in play that we're not completely aware of at this point. But so far, there are strong indications pointing us toward smaller optic zone diameters for better myopia control. Yeah, yeah. So complications was something you guys addressed. And one of the concerns was how many people have seen you know, a, a microbial keratitis. And uh, I think you, you, you posed the question of, uh, and, and got an answer that 86% of respondents reported that microbial keratitis was rarely or never seen. Yep. Now that's, a, that's pretty good. Nearly 90% of the people that have done it have never seen it at all, or rarely have seen it. I think I may have had one patient and right. Yep. I was so proactive. It was like, I was on it. Right. And so it may have not, not been microbial at all, but I think, uh, uh fortunately, uh, with the experiences that have been in the literature and with clinical experiences, we are seeing very, very small incidents of that. Unfortunately, the cases that come up seem to get better press. <laughs> yeah. And uh, a lot of people, it scares a lot of people off from this. Um, and in, in taking it a little further, because it was so rare, we didn't get many responses. But uh, of the people who saw uh, an MK case, uh, patients were discontinued for a period of time, and uh, only about 20% permanently stopped ortho -K afterwards because they resolved. Mm. And um, most of them did return back to uh, ortho-K treatment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, well, one question that I was a little bit discouraged in is sources for increased knowledge of orthokeratology and myopia management. <laughs> I didn't see that you put the myopia podcast as an option in here, or did it just end up being so low? <laughs> it wasn't on there, Dave. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, interesting things. Obviously, the Academy of uh, uh, American Academy of Orthokeratology and Myopia Control, 62 percent, mm -hmm. as their knowledge. What a great thing! And you know, we uh, we we've got them. Th their annual meeting, the Vision by Design meeting, is going to be in my hometown in Bellevue, Washington. So hopefully so we're going to get to see a lot of people out there. So you're hosting mm -hmm. a lot of parties at your house, I'm that's sure. Right. That that's, meeting, okay. <laughs> that's, that's right. Yeah. My practice is just a couple blocks from it. So uh, very cool. 
Yeah, well, you know, I don't want to take up too much of your time. What a great publication. I mean, this documentation that you have here talks about so many more things than we even have addressed here. Um, any last thoughts that we haven't addressed that you think, hey, we, we missed something real big here? Um, I think the potential growth for Ortho K is still very, very impressive. Um, it's just starting, after all these years, starting to get a little bit of traction and really become more mainstream rather than specialty care. Of the fitters, those who are currently fitting, well over half anticipate increasing their fitting of ortho K within the next year. Yeah. But of those who are not fitting currently, uh, almost half of them plan to start within the next two years. So again, if you're out there doing a little bit of ortho K, I mean, you should, I think, take steps to, you know, build that part of your practice now while you're still very unique. There are more people that are going to get into it and it's going to become uh, more competitive. The guys that are doing it now, almost, you know, no competition in the, in the uh, local area. There's not a lot of people in some of the right. towns doing it. Yeah. Yeah. And the more you do it, easier it gets. Right. I mean, not that, not that it's the easiest thing that we do, but it, it just, you see things and you know how to respond to it. And it exactly. You have to get, gain some experience. Uh, there are no, uh, there are some easy cases, but I would say each case is individual. You can't just go into this with a cookbook formula and say, I'm going to fit this lens on every patient. And mm -hmm. um, there are a number of different designs, different customizations that can be done, but um, it's, it's a very rewarding thing. And I, I like to describe it as the most fun you can have and still be at work. <laughs> really, it's, it's very gratifying to see patients. Yeah. And as I like to describe it, it's also the only thing that we do in our profession that provides good vision when you remove the correction. <laughs> you know, all glasses and contacts, you're putting them on. Here, you're taking them off and seeing better. It's just, yeah. it's very exciting to be part of. That's all. It is. It if is, I could uh, leave you with one other little note, and the paper absolutely. you mentioned is published uh, in OVS, and it's available in full access to um, the uh, membership. But uh, again, we're in mid-July talking about this. Probably within the next two or three weeks, it's going to become open access. Mm, great. So great. it will be available in full text for everybody. For, for, for everybody. Yeah. Well, very cool. Well, Mike, I uh, sure appreciate you uh, joining us for this episode. It's uh, yeah, it was fun. always an honor to have you and, and, and get to chat with you. I, I, this is our first time on the Myopia podcast. Hope you become a regular, regular guest, but it was awesome to have you. Thank you for joining me. Uh, thanks for the invite and uh, hope everybody enjoyed it. Yes, absolutely. And thank you for joining us for this episode. Please make sure to like and subscribe and uh, we'll see you again next time on the Myopia podcast. This podcast was brought to you by Optometric Insights Media. If you enjoy our content, please leave a five-star review. And don't forget to subscribe for more great episodes.